probably remember when you were a child, the first time you questioned whether when you see blue or yellow, and someone else says that they see blue or yellow, do they actually see the same color that you do? It's one of those questions that strikes everyone as odd, and there's really no way of answering it. But it's pretty easy to put aside and move on with the rest of your life. The words blue and yellow serve well enough. But it's that area of your experience that no one else can peer into, where there's a big problem, and that's suffering. The suffering that the mind places on itself. You experience it, nobody else can. What it feels like to you, the, the sharpness of the pain, the heaviness of the pain. No one else can experience it. In the same way they have their pain that you can't experience either. There's that famous philosopher Leibniz who said that we're all little monads living in our own little worlds. And this is what he was talking about. There's a huge part of your experience you don't share with anybody. He didn't mention much about suffering. That was the Buddha especially. We see other people suffering and we can sympathize, but we can't really feel their pain. And there's always the question, how much can you go in and help the other person with his or her pain? There are basically two ways. One is through your example of learning how to deal with yours and the good results that can be seen outside as you learn how to deal with your pain. And then when you have the experience, you've learned the techniques, learn how to stop creating your own pain, and then you can offer good advice to others. So this is what we can do to help one another, is to work first on our own pain. That doesn't mean we don't share anything with other people until after we're awakened, but we can as we work in our meditation, get better and better at dealing with this problem, and we're in a better position to help other people deal with theirs. You feel this especially when someone around you is sick or dying. They're going through a process that you can't feel, and you sympathize. But you have to remember, how can you best help them? It's through developing good qualities in your own mind. And one of those paradoxical is equanimity. We usually think that what the other person needs right now is a lot of goodwill, a lot of warmth. And that may be part of it, but in order to provide skillful warmth, skillful help, skillful goodwill, it has to be backed up by equanimity, the ability to step back and rely on that part of the mind that's not affected by anything. We talk about the committee of the mind. And this is one member that tends to get overlooked, the part that just knows and can bear it. Whatever comes up, it knows and bears. It can endure. And usually it's not offered much prominence at the table when the committee members are having their dinner conversation. But it's a really important one to develop. Sometimes you feel when your emotions are running high, how can you find any equanimity at all? It's there already. You don't have to create it. Just remember, it's there as one of the members. It's the part of the mind that just registers things. And whatever it is, good, bad, and different, it can register. John Mahabhava makes the point often that our mind is really resilient. If it weren't really resilient, considering all the suffering that it's experienced through all your many lifetimes, it would have been nothing but smithereens a long time ago. But it keeps on knowing keeps on registering, keeps on noticing. Then the suffering comes from the, the next step when you start reacting. 
deciding that you like this, you don't like that, can stand this, can't stand that. And things that you can actually stand, you tell yourself you can't stand. And then you get thrown into a tizzy, and you're not going to help the people around you. They're already in a tizzy. But if you can be solid, you're offering an awful lot. They may be just quiet in the background. I knew someone in college in our, when I was waiting tables on our wait staff. Didn't talk much for the rest of the staff. Just did his job. And when staff was having his conversations before that, before we served the meal, all the other people were the light of the party. This person hardly talked. And at the end of the year, it turned out this was the person everybody in the room liked. Because they knew that he did his job. And so that's what equanimity and patience are. It's the quiet member of the staff, the quiet member of the committee. They do their job. And we have to learn how to appreciate that, just the ability to notice things and not react. Because that's the part of the mind that allows you to develop strength. When you're coming from that strength, when you're not wasting your time and energy with a lot of other proliferations on top of that, then you're in a much better position to see what needs to be done. So that your own pain is not weakening you. To learn to see equanimity and patience in a good light. They're an, an important part of every situation inside your mind to help you deal with issues, and also outside your mind when you're dealing with other people. We tend to think of equanimity as being cold and indifferent, but that's not the case. It's learning how to husband your strength so that you can devote it to things where you really can make a difference. If you don't have that ability to step back, there are two problems. One is you start rushing into a situation hoping to help, and you end up doing yourself harm. Two, you rush in and you end up doing other people harm because you can't see clearly what needs to be done. The first type is what John Fung would call Madoff falling down the well. You see somebody else down the well, you try to pull them up, but they're heavier than you can pull. They end up pulling you down. The second type is when someone else is getting out of the well, and you have your ideas about how they can get out faster, and you end up pushing them back in. Neither type is very helpful. Equanimity has to come first. It has to be your strength. This is why we practice concentration and try to get the mind to those levels of concentration where the mind is just there, not getting worked up about it, not getting excited, not getting down, just right on an even keel. We don't tend to think of that as a gift to others, but it is. It's the basis for all our other gifts. So learn how to strengthen it. Learn how to get the mind there when you need it there. Of course, that means learn how to get it there before you need it there. Gain some practice in just being very still. And you know, no, no. But you're not reacting. You're not going the next step. And there's a lot of strength that can come from that ability. <laughs>